possible. Who here got something to eat tonight from in the back? Raise your hand. All right, everybody in here before they leave tonight should get something to eat or drink, whether it's tea, pastry, vegan eats, smoothies, no matter what it is. We gotta support black business. We gotta support black institutions, especially black institutions that are making it happen despite the odds stacked against them. In Sankofa, Video Books and Cafe is a perfect example of that. And it's a testament of why we gotta speak about the whole reparations issue in the very first place. Because right now, we are in a race war. And race war in the sense that we are in a race against a system that has put us way behind the finish line from the very start. And the question is, how do we rectify, or how do the people and the institutions that brought us there, how do they atone for what they have done? How do they atone for the atrocities brought against our ancestors? How do they atone for the structural inequality that they manufactured that persists until this day? And another question that we have to ask ourselves in this reparations discussion is, with all of this discussion going on among the so-called 2020 Democratic candidates, what is the probability that reparations will be a reality? And also, what does that look like? You know, I'm pretty sure that those of y'all who are here tonight have been asking yourselves the same questions. I'm very grateful that you're here. And that is why I'm very happy to introduce to the stage uh, a well-known scholar, not only in the DC metropolitan area, but globally, a scholar who has been very involved in the reparations discussion for quite some time now. He's written works about it. He's spoken about it. He's been among people in spaces talking about reparations, not only nationally, but internationally. And it is my pleasure to introduce him to the All Eyes on DC stage, y'all. Let's give Dr. Ray Wimbush an All Eyes on DC hand, y'all. That means you gotta clap as loud as you can, y'all. Once again, welcome to All Eyes on DC. Um, before we get started, I just want to um, reflect on, on on my introduction to your work. From what I recall, you were at the Malcolm X um, assassination commemoration across the street about four years ago, four winters ago, talking about reparations. Um, and then I met you again at the Justice at Else March. And then I met you one more time last year when we had the All Eyes on DC show here talking about black love. So, you know, it's everything's coming to full circle now. We got you here before the All Eyes on DC audience just talking about this very important issue. Um, you know, I spoke a little bit about your work in the reparations field, but I think you can do that more justice than I can, definitely. If you wouldn't mind just telling the audience about your scholarship, you know, more about it and just uh, what you have in the works, if anything, right now concerning that issue. Well, you know, the work that I've been doing, I mean, thanks for inviting me to talk here. Uh, I remember like 30 something years, about 35 years ago, I started doing research on reparations. And I remember I was teaching at Fish University in Nashville at the time. Um, and people were kind of laughing. So why are you talking about reparations? You know, we ain't never gonna get reparations. Uh, that's a pipe dream. Black folk been talking about 40 acres and mules since 1865. But uh, Randall Robinson wrote a book at the turn of this past century uh, called The Debt. And um, it was an essay about reparations. And Randy and I know each other, and he said, Ray, what you need to do is do the research on what I essayed about. So uh, we assembled, a, had a major meeting at Fish University, of reparations activists and scholars from around the world in like 1999. And out of that came this book, uh, Should America Pay? And which some people call, I mean, I'm amazed this book is still selling. And, uh, but some people call it like the Bible of the reparations struggle. If you read it, you really study it. And so uh, it, be, it got into the ether. We had the major uh, world conference against racism in South Africa that I was in attendance, as well as other reparations article uh, activists. And what was very important about the Durban meeting was that 
for the first time in history, we got the transatlantic slave trade declared as a crime against humanity. And that's one of the criteria, criteria for getting reparations. Uh, some people said that Should America Pay was too hard to read. So a few years later, I wrote this book, Belinda's Petition. And it's a breakdown, like an overview of reparations. And it talks about a sister named Belinda Sutton Royale back in 1782 who had been in prison and enslaved in Massachusetts for 50 years from her master on the outbreak of the uh, Revolutionary War, American Revolutionary War. Her master, who was siding with the British Sam, fled to Canada. And she sued her master for 50 years of unpaid labor. Uh, it's one of the first written petitions that we see about you know, reparation. And the amazing thing about it, she won the case. And this was before Facebook, Twitter, Amen. or anything else like this. She won the case of about $1,500 a year, which was a lot of money back in the day. They didn't all pay it before a few years, but she won it. Uh, what was interesting when I was doing the research uh, on it in Massachusetts, I noticed that Belinda signed the petition with an X, she couldn't read or write. And come to find out that the person who had written a beautiful prose arguing her position for wanting reparations was a sister that lived about five miles from her named Phyllis Wheat. So, uh, and we tend to not connect people that are in contemporary, you know, especially with our history. So that's kind of an overview. I mean, there's a lot of little details on it, but that's how I got interested. It seemed like everything that black folk have been doing in this country for the past, look, look in this world for the past 500 years, is cleaning up white people's mess. Mm -hmm. and, and in that process of cleaning, we've been trying to repair the damage. I mean, it's ironic that today is the 65th anniversary of Brown versus Board, which is another attempt. I don't agree with it necessarily about integration, but it's another attempt to clean up the mess that white people have caused us. So that's kind of an overview. Definitely. You know, let, let's touch on the human rights issue, um, especially given the fact that Malcolm's birthday is coming up on the 19th, and he, you know, was vying to bring that issue before the United Nations. I think that's a very pivotal point in history. Um, when you're speaking about human rights, and even going back to Durban, if I recall correctly, um, there were provisions in what was presented that the Western powers were against, kind of, right? Oh, or, <laughs> slightly, yeah. Okay. Absolutely. They were against, well, the United States walked out of the meeting. And keep in mind, at that time, the Secretary of State was Colin Powell. And his representative walked out of the meeting. They came there, put some demands on the table. If you know anything about the UN, you don't really come in and tell people what to do. It's all a negotiation process. And so they walked out. We applauded them and said, you know, don't let the door hit your back when you go. But uh, they didn't. They objected to everything. The Israelis were also against it. The Palestinians were on our side. The Roma people uh, were on our side. And, and we got it passed. It was a resolution. And it led to lawsuits immediately after that, too. So how have those lawsuits manifested, um, you know, there's, there's winning the victory, and then there's actually doling out, you know, the the rewards or the awards. You know, what what's the what's the status of that right now? Well, the two major lawsuits that immediately followed Durbin was the Chicago case. Uh, uh, Deidre Farmer Pellman sued 22 corporations, and she lost that case. Uh, the whole issue about, you know, she wanted an apology from Aetna Life Insurance. And most of you probably know that insurance companies during enslavement of our ancestors would insure Africans. They would, but the, the policy of anything happened to the African would go to the so-called master. So it's like right now, I got car insurance. And if something happens to my car, they give me the check. They don't give it to the car. Where they would give checks to masters so-called masters. 
And so uh, J.P. Morgan Chase, the bank she sued them, Edna Life Insurance, which was the major enslaver of, uh, or you know, these so-called slave policies during that time. So she said, uh, and lost the case, saying that these companies had, the judge said that these companies had, you know, gotten better. But see, that's not what reparations are. The second, and I will go into that later, but the second case was out in Oklahoma uh, as a result of the uh, Tulsa massacre that took place in 1921, Black Wall Street. And Johnny Cochran, the late Johnny Cochran, was one of the um, you know, lawyers in that suit. And my former professor in Chicago, John O. Franklin, whose father was the lawyer for the people who were burned out in Tulsa, Oklahoma, when they burned down Black Wall Street. That case was law saying that nobody, they should have brought the lawsuit at the time that the incident occurred, when black folk couldn't sue. You know, so it's a lot of, it has been a lot of, you know, just whatever excuse white people make not to give compensatory measures. Now, to be sure, J.P. Morgan paid some reparations after that uh, in North Carolina. Uh, I'm sorry, in Louisiana, Wachovia, the old Wachovia bank that is now Will Fargo, they paid some in North Carolina. But in general, um, this nation has refused to pay reparations. And so people were saying, well, you'll never, you know, were telling me and other, you know, people like Conrad will real, uh, Deidre, uh, Adjo Ayatoro, some of you know her, um, that we would never get it to the presidential level, that people were discussing it. But you see that we yeah. are at that level. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm very interested in, like, in hearing your take on that. Like, what, you know, what is that all about? You know, is it, is, is it, is it, is it, is it that the Trump era is that serious for some folk that, that folks are really now, you know, putting out this red herring for black people or like, you know, what is it that is, you know, getting a good, you know, a, a good amount of the 20 some odd candidates, you know, even entertaining the oh, idea of yeah. And some of those black folk that were opposed to them 10 years ago, I, I ain't going to mention any names, but okay. The issue is this, this is the first time since 1992 that if you don't completely win the black vote, you're gonna lose the election. And people say, well, what about Clinton? He had the black vote. Uh, what about Barack? He had the black vote. What about John Kerry, who lost? He had the black vote. What about Hillary Clinton? This time, if you don't have the black vote, you're gonna lose. So with a lot of these things, and I mean, Thank goodness for Sheila Jackson Lee, the you know, Congresswoman from Texas. She's been very active and, and, and arguably more active than John Conyers, who first introduced H.R. 40 in making sure this bill gets to that point. I think that you gotta look carefully at what people are saying who's running for president. Most of them are saying things sound like, uh, well, I support a commission to study reparations. You know, you can have a commission all night long, you know. I want to look at, you know, people who are actually saying we want to pay reparations. And so far, there's really only about three candidates saying that. Uh, you, Julian Castro, believe it or not, uh, what's her face, Elizabeth Warren, up the road. And then Cory Booker, more or less, because he has this thing called baby bonds. I don't know if you read about this stuff. So I want to see how this develops. You know, yeah, and and Mary Ann Williamson, who's a lesser candidate, she's been very, I mean, she said $100 billion, which is, as far as I'm concerned, a down payment. You know, that ain't even, you know $100 billion, and it, it's got to be, we start at one trillion. We start at one trillion. And that's sort of why I see it as pandering, you know, because, you know, they, they understand that black folks are frustrated that you know that that pretty much the rest of the world finally acknowledges and sees what we've been seeing all along and now they need something to pull us in you know my question for you now is how would reparations look you know i've heard several theories um one being from a man named uh, uh, uh 
John Cheeks, I'm not sure if you're familiar with him. He was a candidate for um, uh, Eleanor Holmes Norton seat last election cycle, but he had an idea um, that was similar to reparations. But I'm very interested in hearing, you know, what's your take on that? So, you know, if they were to, you know, um, recompensate us or compensate us for, you know, this, you know, whatever amount, right? How would it look and what form would it take? Well, reparations are going to take a variety of things. It's just like, again, the 65th anniversary of Brown v. Board. Out of Brown v. Board, you had spinoff on uh, voting rights, open housing, affirmative action, a variety of things. Reparations are going to be the same way. It can take place in a variety of ways. For example, it could be a check in the mail, which a lot of people talk about. It could be, as far as my roster brothers and sisters are concerned, they said, look, give me $100,000 and a ticket, a one-way ticket to Africa, and I'm good. Okay, it could literally be that. Uh, it could be in the form of saying every black person over the age of 18 will not pay taxes, any kind of tax, sales, income, for a period of 10 years. It could be that way. Uh, it can be in the form of scholarships. Uh, to universities. So it can be in a variety of ways. Um, when we were doing some research, when I was teaching at Fish University, uh, we came across this family called the Espy family. In fact, you could read about this study online. It's called Torn from the Land. And we, it's one of the more comprehensive studies that I was involved with on reparation. We found this family named the Espy family in Florida. And they had their land taken by the federal government for an Air Force landing strip right before, well, right during World War II. And the Air Force said, look, after <coughs> World War II, we'll give you the land back. Well, you know, that was a lie. They didn't give the land back. Guess who they sold it to? The, the summer camp for the Los Angeles Dodgers. And we actually approached the Los Angeles Dodgers, they didn't know. I mean, they didn't know, they said we got it from the government. But they didn't know how the government, who they got. So the Espy family, they should be compensated for their land. And I could name a bunch of cases like that. You can uh, read, there's a chapter in my book that I wrote called, uh, what I call, And the Earth Move, that talks about land confiscation, or land theft. Black people, in 1920, in this country, owned 10 million acres of land. We now own about 3 million acres of land. And, some, and, and what I'm citing are statistics about eight or nine years old. It's probably down to about 1.5 million. And so our land was taken in a variety of ways from us. And so it can be in the form of land restoration. And it could be a check in the mail. You know, the SPs may say, look, we want $30 million for this land that was stolen from us. You know, and land theft was very, you know, prominent in this country. And, you know, speaking of which, that made me think about gentrification and, you know, eminent domain and just how the same land grabs are happening to this very day. Um, I'm curious, you know, you brought up a whole lot of points, and I'm just thinking in my head about what direction to take this conversation in. I want to talk about uh, in Cobra uh, um, um, real quick. By any chance, do you have any plans of attending the conference later on in June? Oh yeah, absolutely. And I, I'm encouraging everyone out here to come to Detroit in June to the Encobra conference, uh, the third weekend in June. You can go and get it on the Encobra website. Encobra, for those who don't know, is National uh, Coalition of Blacks for Reparations in America, and that's the oldest. Uh, Organization, so yeah, I'll be there. And we're talking about restructuring in COVID. I mean, it's going to be a very frank and honest dialogue about reparations and organizing around reparations. And see, I always tell my, tell my colleagues, no black person, including me, is working full time on reparations. And I'm not talking about you do it, you know, part time. That you go to work for reparations. If you look at the Jews immediately after World War II, they worked full time on getting reparations, and they got it. And they, I mean, there's a book by Michael uh, 
Finkelstein called uh, the Holocaust industry that discusses this whole thing. So uh, we're going to be meeting in Detroit. Uh, Minister Farrakhan is going to be there. Uh, Danny Glover is going to be there and several other reparations activists. Danny Glover is a reparations activist and a lot of people don't know that. So, and it's not just going to be the celebrity, but those people who are down on the ground working for reparations. Yeah, Danny Glover is oftentimes on the front lines, you know, for a lot of issues. So, I, you know, um, out of all like the Hollywood stars, you know, I, I often see him time and time again. It's very interesting to know that or to hear that from you. Uh, going to us tackling reparations full time. You know, um, so a few years back myself, I did some advocacy, um, you know, around HR 40. And, you know, and, and, and you know, for those of y'all who don't know, that's the bill that's been in um, limbo in the house for as long as I've been alive. You know what I'm saying? We're talking like 30, yeah, exactly. Like 30 years, you know, um, former Congressman John Conyers introduced it in like every year or like every term. It just, it's up and then it dies and then it comes back. So, you know, in just trying to advocate for that, I heard a couple of reasons why people were against reparations, you know. So you had some people who sort of bought into the propaganda that like, that black folks just want handouts and that we're lazy, right? And then you have another contingent of folks who believe that, that, like, that like the U.S. money is blood money and that the U.S., we as black people, Pan-Africanists especially, shouldn't be taking blood money from colonizers, you know, even though that money came from our labor, you know, and you also have, let me think of it, you also have one more contingent who believes that no matter what form of reparations we get, they're just gonna move the dial even further to make sure that whatever, it is, to make sure that, whatever that is, isn't effective in us building together, you know, so I just wanna hear a little bit about, you know, if you've come across those same detractors and you know, what's your message to them? Well, you know, I've heard, I've heard it is, it's funny, literally, I travel around the world talking about this subject. It, it's funny how black folk have, to me, greater doubts that we're gonna get reparation than white folk. Black folk will come to me and they'll say things like, well, you know, you get a check in the mail on Monday, Doc, on Tuesday, the Cadillac deals must be rich, you know. I mean, and that's a reflection of self-hatred. Hey, one that's, second. Dave Chappelle yeah. did a skit about that, man, right. like 15 years ago. I remember that, yeah. Right, and, and see, you know, I was tired of reparations being viewed as a joke or a punchline, like Chappelle. I ain't got nothing against Dave, I like his stuff. but. When ta Coates wrote the article in 2014, which all of us should read in The Atlantic, called The Case for Reparations, 22,000 word essay. It's one of, it is the, one of the most brilliant treatises about reparations. Yeah. Uh, black folk, I think, have doubts about reparations because we have doubts about justice. Hmm. I mean, we have doubts that white people are gonna do the same right thing and, and I agree with that. You, you, white people just don't do the right thing. And they say, oh, we got to do something for these black folk. You know, they do it if you force them to do it. Mm -hmm. And we have to be assertive and forceful about the press for reparations. White folks have come up to me. I was giving a lecture in L.A. a couple years ago about reparations. This white boy came up to me afterwards, and he said, uh, uh, Dr. Wimbush, you know, I know that we owe reparations. How much do you people want? Uh, All of it. <laughs> look, my, look, you know, if you read about John Henry Clark, people ask him how many Africans were stolen from Africa. And Dr. Clark gave the best answer I ever read. He said, we must begin the count at 50 million. You begin the count at 50 million. If you're going to talk about reparations, you must begin the count of at least a trillion dollars. Um, the, the Ghana Declaration back in 1994 did a total cost of enslavement, colonialism, the extraction of minerals out of Africa, yep. mahogany, oil, gold, diamonds, 
all of this stuff, and, and then they said it as 75 million people, their cause saying that we should be compensated to the level of $11 trillion. So we're not talking about small numbers about this stuff. We're talking about big numbers. White folks know they owe us. They know it. It's not, they don't have any doubt in their mind about it. You know, I get Google fees on the word reparation. Almost all the opposition is coming from white folks, mm -hmm. except if you meet these Uncle Toms like, uh, what's her name, Stacy Dash mm -hmm. or Ben Carson. I mean, you know, but yeah. most of this stuff is coming from white people. They know that we owe, they owe us. And like Malcolm said, you know, white people think because they build up this country and, like he said, stick their chest out. You know, they had the homestead land rush. You probably know about that, read about it in history. And you know, the, got on their wagons and went west. Black folk couldn't participate in that. You know, white folks got all, and it's not, it's absolutely true that white people got their wealth based on the labor of our ancestors. And that can be proven empirically. There's a black economist at um, uh, Georgetown named Richard America. And he has put, he wrote a book called um, What Do You People Want? Mm. And it's about reparation. So, you know, they know they owe us. And I think that we have to believe that we can get reparations. And, you know, I didn't think that we would, I, I knew that it was eventually it was going to get to the national level. Frankly, I didn't think it was going to get this quick. But it is an issue. And read again Ta-Nehisi Coates' article, too. You know, that, it's very interesting. You know, let's talk about how it got to the national level so quick because you have a contingent of, you know, people who, are, who, who would tell you that it was their advocacy, you know, um, their media push, right? Their, organi their organizing that got the reparations uh, um, debate to the forefront of the Democratic primary. And, you know, by that group, I'm speaking about uh, the American Descendants of Slavery, also known as ADOS, ADOS, how, however you want to call them. Um, what's your take on that situation? Because, you know, ever since they got talked about on MSNBC as a Russian box, um, you know, Yvette Carnell in particular, she's been just, you know, really out there, you know, speaking against um, Pan-Africanism pretty much, you know. Well, she's always been against Pan-Africanism, and she has, um, she, she's, 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 she's of the mindset pretty much that, you know, the laws that were put in place, such as affirmative action and whatever else, you know, black immigrants and, you know, Latino immigrants and other groups have taken advantage of that and it hasn't been exclusively for black people or black people who are descendants of the Maafa, you know. Um, what is your take on, you know, that in the context of reparations? You know, how do we, you know, is that something that we should reconcile? You know, uh, is that something as far as reparations, should that, you know, how does what you talk about in the international context fit within what she's saying or like, or like, how does it counter it, I guess, is what I'm asking. Well, see, it's like that old saying during Watergate. You gotta follow the money. First of all, you gotta ask who, first of all, why would a group just call themselves American descendants of slaves? And I don't wanna just sound rhetorical, but we're the descendants of African kings and queens. Yes. Why are we distinguishing, and I'm asking Ados this, why are we distinguishing between Africans that lived in Jamaica, Brazil, on the continent, or for that matter, Chicago? You know, and, and like John Henry Clark said, we need to quit talking about where we were dropped off at. <laughs> we need to start talking about where we were picked up at. And we were all picked up in Africa. I mean, and, and you know, this sounds like a simplistic thing to say, but what Ados does is go against all of that. I don't know anyone that's in the rep Sheila Jackson League. I mean, I could go into a depth about that, but I'm gonna leave it at that. The funding for Ados comes from right-wing white supremacist groups. So why would white supremacists want to fund a group, and I call it a cult, 
on reparations because they know that's going to alienate the black vote. I mean, the white vote. White people are like, we ain't paying no reparations if all these candidates. And the second thing, there's another hashtag that ADOS is putting out here called Tangibles 2020. And Tangibles 2020 is saying, if you don't, they don't support reparations, don't vote. So what you have from the right-wing white supremacists is a voter suppression movement in the form of ADOS. So, you know, Francis Chris Wellesley says, and, and Mr. Fuller, Neely Fuller, you know, you know who he is, I know. Uh, but the number one tool of white supremacy is deceit. It's deceit. They fool us. And we have to go deeper than what ADOS is leading us. How are you going to say those Africans from other countries get what we deserve? We would have to get rid of Marcus Garvey, uh, Malcolm, you know, Malcolm. We got to get rid of a whole lot of African people. We should look at ourselves as an African family in various parts of the globe. And for Eidos to come and split us up or attempt to split us up like that, it's insane. Beautifully put. Uh, what, what's the current status of reparations, would you say? I'm, I'm not going to say all around the world, but I know, you know, in South Africa, uh, you have um, the land redistribution um, discussion happening uh, to some degree being actualized. Uh, I, I'm just curious to know what does that look like in other parts of the world where Africans have been oppressed and have lost their resources? Well, it's a very good question. In South Africa, for example, you mentioned the land reform in Zimbabwe, the same thing. In the Caribbean, you have CARICOM, who have 15 nations who have gotten together to press for the issue for their former colonial masters. Uh, CARICOM stands for Caribbean Community, and it's and that's that's another movement. Ados again, they try to say they are comparable to CARICOM. They're not because there's cooperation between the United States and CARICOM. There's cooperation in Europe with African people in this country about the issue of reparation. I gave a lecture in Scotland of all places with some European Africans who were organizing mightily about the issue of reparations. So uh, it's it's all over the world and in the United States is coming to a head. So I guess my question at this point is, you know, beyond the Durban conference, what does organizing, you know, globally look go globally look like? And you know, what kind of pressure, international pressure can be placed on the United States to actualize reparations. What does that look like in your eyes? Well, that's that's another trick of the United States. Uh, most of you have heard of the International Court in The Hague. The United States is not a member of the International Court. So you see how they take brothers from Africa, and some of them deserve it, you know, to the you know, ICC and all of that. The United States can't be taken to court on an international level. But what you can do is put pressures on bodies like the United Nations to tell, and they have issued statements about reparations. And the United Nations uh, Human Rights Commission has gone on record and said that Africans in the United States deserve reparations um, and, will, and specify how they should be distributed. Uh, the organizing right now, I'm going to be very honest with you, and I know this is being broadcast, but uh, we have to get a full-time staff, as I said earlier, working on reparations. Um, and, and, and that's what we're going to be talking about in Detroit in a few weeks. Because until you get lawyers, like lawyers, academics, congressmen working full time on this issue, elected officials, it's going to be more difficult. We've done a lot without that, but we could do more with it. And that's what one of the things I'm going to be talking about in Detroit. See, you know, and to that point, I'm going to be very transparent myself and say that I too have reservations about, you know, I have reservations about at least the Congress people's part, you know, in just shepherding, you know, reparations and making that happen between gerrymandering 
between voter suppression, between the influx of corporate dollars going into campaigns, and with just, you know, I'm, and I'm gonna say this on the record, you know, uh, the CBC, you know, as an entity has been pretty inept or, you know, pretty ineffective relative to the Ron Dellum days, right? You know, so with that being said, you know, what's it gonna take or what does a product of that body look like for them to even full out support reparations, not just the study, but a full doling out of money and resources, you know? Um, you know, because they see something happening, of course, but, you know, you know, us as a people, and once again, I'm being very blunt here, unless it's an election cycle, the majority of us aren't really tied in into the everyday machinations of politics, you understand? Like, so I'm just curious to see how that's going to play out with the reparations discussion, you know? Even if we do have the lawyers and the activists working side by side daily, in and out with the issue, with the Congress people, holding the legislative power and the power to write these laws, you know, how does that product look like and who is it incumbent upon to make them move the down on it? Well, first of all, if you rely on the CBC, as you say, to give reparation, we ain't never gonna give them, okay? It doesn't mean that there aren't Congress people working for it, but as a whole. I propose this thing and I outlined it in, uh, Belinda's petition called the Glass Model. And I think there's five groups. If you look at any movement, civil rights movement, Nation of Islam, Garvey during the 1920s, and so forth, there's five groups that you have to have. And I, that's why I call it the Glass Model. The first one, the G stands for grassroots organizations. They have to press, and that would be in Cobra and places like that. The L stands for legislatures, which we've just talked about. The A stands for attorneys. You gotta have uh, people like, uh, I don't know, like Roger Wareham. I don't know if you know Roger Wareham. Okay, D12 movement. Yeah, yeah. You have to have scholars. You know, uh, people who just write and do that. And finally, you have to have students. And if you look at the civil rights movement, we had those five groups in place. Right now, of those we have all five of those in place, but they're all weak, you know, and we've got to strengthen the glass model. And so uh, movements don't happen unless you have attorneys and the people I just named. And uh, the reparation, like I said, it's gonna be a, a day of reckoning, if you please, or a weekend of reckoning in Detroit when we talk about this very openly and honestly. So, you know, going back to the glass model, what, what's making it so weak right now? Or, or like, why is it weak at this point? Money. You need money. Money, okay. You, you need, you need, I wish right now, that's why I need to hit the lottery or something. Are you going to If, you know, I wish right now I had about $50 million and I would give 10 to 20 of it to a reparations organization. Uh, pay people. 20 people, $100,000 to work full time on doing that. Again, I'm just saying what Jews did after World War II. They put, the reason why Holocaust has become, I mean, if you, and if you even say the word Holocaust, you know, you say, oh, that's Jewish. If I ask black people how many Jews died in the ovens, people have a knee jerk six million. They put that stuff out there. Uh, if I ask black people how many black folk died on the middle passage, we say, I don't know, we're not sure. So we have to have education about what happened to us, and we have to have a full-time reparations group. Um, I don't feel there's any excuse for that, but there's several of us right now that are working on some people with deep pockets. I read today there's 13 black billionaires on earth, 13 black billionaires on earth. Like, we don't need a billion dollars from them. But to, you know, so we're going to be approaching them about getting some money for the establishment of a full time group. Yeah, I think that's pretty much the most commonsensical way to go, just given the fact that previous movements had financial support, you know, from people who had the means. You know, they stayed in the background, they funneled the funds. I wanted to touch on the whole education piece because 
you know, you being a scholar yourself and an educator, I'm not going to ask you to comment, you know, specifically on, you know, your job per se, but like, just, you know, just speaking on, and I'm speaking as somebody who, you know, who talks to elders, you know, elder teachers, um, baby boomer teachers, they're often very critical of um, youth my age, and especially the youth who are like in their mid-twenties, late teens, you know, as far as like their, um, as far as like their their um, intellectual curiosity, or just like you know, their willingness to study and to be very um, to be to be to, to to be very passionate about understanding the issue from many facets, you know, um, how much of a Achilles heel do you think that is, you know, or like is that even a factor in just you know our inability to keep the movement going? Well, it is a fact. It's, and I don't want to start, you know, bashing you. I don't do that anyway. I love young folk. And I always say, when young people stop listening to me, I'm going to quit. I'm going to retire. You know, um, I teach young people at Morgan, you know. And if I, I, this is my 46th year of teaching in higher education. And I said, I'm going to punch out in 50 years, you know. So I got about three or four more years to go. Um, what I've noticed in the evolution of young people from the early 70s when I started teaching to now is young people don't read as much as they did when I first started teaching in the 70s. Um, the average American reads 2.5 books a year. In other words, they don't even finish the third book. 2.5. Japanese read six books a year. <coughs> I don't know how many books the average black person, I mean, we're surrounded by books now. Yeah. You know, we're surrounded by knowledge now. I mean, when I went through high school and college, we didn't have nothing called the internet. I mean, my right. students, I asked them a question, they, they grabbed their phone, Googled it, whatever. I think that reading still is important. Last thing, you know, I don't know if I should tell them, because my President Morgan might be listening to this, but I'm gonna tell the story anyway. Last, um, September, I was teaching a course, Theories of Personality, because my area is psychology. I asked, because this is a true story, I asked the class, uh, who was Alice Walker? Mm. And, and the sister said, she, I, I was actually lecturing, and somebody, I said Alice Walker, and the sister said, who's Alice Walker? And I looked at, you know, this general wave to the rest of the members of the class, I said, Look, somebody tell his sister who Alice Walker is. Nobody knew. Then I said, I'm going to say uh, three words, and I'm going to see if you, that makes a connection for it. But nobody, this is a class of about 35 students. I said, the color purple, those were the three words. Oh, yeah, Dr. Wim, I've heard of that. You know, but see, there was no connection. They said, I saw the movie, but did you read the book? I saw Beloved, but did you read the book? You know, I saw Confessions of Nat Turner. I mean, you know, what was the name of the book? What was the name of that movie that came out a couple years ago about that? Birth of a Nation? Yeah, Birth of a Nation. But did you read about that? So reading is important, and there's more availability of reading materials now than there were years ago. And so if I were to say, and then and I'm gonna, and I always distinguish between reading a book and studying a book, because studying is deeper than reading. And you, you read Belinda's petition, you study should America pay, and there's a difference. And studying means get your pencil out, your pen, get a notebook, and go. It may take you a month to get through a book, but that's studying a book. And that, if I were to say the biggest difference between young people that I taught 46 years ago and now, you know, they don't read as much. One of my students, uh, you probably know of her, Michelle Alexander. Uh, she wrote the book, mm -hmm. The New Jim Crow. Wow. And I taught her at Vanderbilt, mm -hmm. you know, and I didn't even know I had taught her. Yeah. But Michelle, I, I brought, brought her to Morgan a few years ago, just about three years ago, and when she got off the plane, she said, Ray, and she hugged me. And I said, do I know you? She said, Ray, you taught me. Uh -huh. And then she recalled that she did, I did teach her at uh, 
Vanderbilt. Um, one of my four, and she read. She was always reading. She made me recall getting old, and I forget some of that stuff. Um, uh, one of my students was Charles King that I didn't know that I had taught. Uh, Charles King, I don't know if you saw the film Third Hood. Um, he did uh, Fences with no. Denzel in that yeah. one, also called Israel. I didn't know I had taught him at Vanderbilt. Mm -hmm. I didn't know I had taught him at Vanderbilt. And the way I found out, I was giving a keynote address on a black film uh, festival down in Nashville. Somebody said I had contributed a lot to Hollywood. And the only thing I contributed to Hollywood was buying a movie ticket, I thought. And uh, come to find out, she said that Charles King had said that I was the inspiration for him going to Hollywood. Can we clap for this brother? Mm -hmm. Sorry, man. But, but look how look how connections are. Look how connections are. Charles had when he was a student at Vanderbilt, he would always follow me around. Like he was like a little nerd, you know. And he would follow me around and say, Ray, if you had to do it all over again, what would you do? You know, I said, Well, I'd make movies. And he said, Well, that's what I'm gonna do, Doc. Oh, wow. He said, but they're going to be positive movies. Amen. And that's what he's been doing. You know, he ain't Tyler Perry, right. if you understand. Yeah. But here, dig this connection. Yes, sir. <clears throat> About a year ago, I was sitting at home. It was late at night, like 11.30. I ready to go to bed. And the phone rang. It was from California. And I looked at the phone, and it said, uh, I knew it was from L.A. It said, from Beverly Hills. I picked up the phone, I said, uh, he said, may I speak to Ray Winbridge? I said, this is he. He said, this is Ryan Coogler. Hmm. And I said, Ryan Coogler, only Ryan Coogler I know is the one that directed the Black Panther. Mm -hmm. He said, well, that's who this is. Wow. And I said, who is this? You know, I thought it was one of my students from Morgan. But it really was Ryan Coogler. Hmm. And he knew that I had done my doctorate at University of Chicago in 1969. And he said that he wanted to, he was troubled by the fact that he had, um, you know, <coughs> young people know Black Panther is a superhero. Right. So he said he wanted to make a real film about, you know, a Black Panther. And he chose Fred Hampton. Mm -hmm. And this December 4th of this year is the 50th anniversary of the assassination of uh, Fred Hampton. So I've been running back and forth to Chicago doing the research for the film. It'll be out, you know, either late this year or early next year. And I've been working with Ryan Coogler, who's a good friend of Charles King, you mm -hmm. see. So those connections, you know, turn. Those people read. Ryan Coogler is the smartest young person I've ever seen in my life. You think Black Panther, I had lunch with that dude in Chicago. He is absolutely brilliant. So I think that, and I'm saying this is a long discussion about yeah. your question, but I think that as educators, reading, there's nothing that can yeah. replace reading. That's right. And if I said, the, you know, like, read 30 minutes a day. I say that in my first book about raising black boys. If you can read 30 minutes a day about black folk, you'll be a full person. Hmm. And, and my students, Doc, you know, you know I get 30 minutes is a long time, uh -huh. Doc. You know, I said, but you look at Empire for an hour. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, you look yeah, at the next season. Yeah, yeah, you ain't doing the next season. It's gone. Yeah, you know, I knew the white folks were gonna take it off yeah. one day what? after they made the money anyway. But so I think that we gotta read more than we and if I mean just and have reading circle. Yeah. Reading is the difference I see right now between now and then. Understood. And you know, just thank you for going. All around, yeah, cause sorry, I got man. nine. Don't apologize, man. We got way more out of the answer than we expected, and it was very great. You know, just learning all of that. I want to follow up, just asking you. You know, as a researcher, which are nearly fifty years in the game, what goes into research? What's that process like? You know, you know, uh, if you could just speak about that briefly in the context of this book, right? Here, Should America pay? Oh, uh, you know, what I like research is like it's like being an explorer. Mm -hmm. And people will call us up, like at the institute that I directed, Morgan State Institute for Urban Research, and we just today hired Stacy Patton. I don't know if y'all know who Stacy Patton is. Mm -hmm. Brilliant young sister. Um, we 
somebody will give us a problem, or if you out of your own curiosity, you say, I want to find out more about that, and then you start digging. You start digging deeper, and you keep, and as you research anything, you move from one place to another. I'm in the process of doing research. I want to find out where Belinda was buried. Um, so I've been going through census records up in Massachusetts, uh, online, a variety of other things, and I'm discovering a lot of things. So that's how I like to approach. It's like, it's like a treasure hunt almost. And then once you get your research together, you assemble it, you organize it, you may want to publish it, you may want to present it, but you do something with it, you know. And I think that that's, you know, that's what I get out of it as a scholar, you know. Um, everybody's not cut out for research. Sometimes it's boring. Sometimes you get a dead end, you know. Yeah, I was going to say because, you know, because it, it's, like, it's like raw information and you got to, like, interpret it. You got to synthesize it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, my book, uh, Warrior Method, which is a program for rearing healthy black boys, I wrote that book while I was in Ghana, but the research took about three years because I had heard about this secret society called Poro Society, you know, and that's, that was like getting boys to men, and Sandy Society is getting girls to women. And it took me a year to do that research because when I went to Ghana, a lot of people, they said they don't talk about Poro Society. And I had to find somebody that was a member of Poro Society. And that took a lot of questions and as they had to gain trust. And then I wrote about it. So research, it's like a treasure hunt. And I like it. I like it. You made me think of something. I'm going to talk to you about that offline. My man. Okay. okay. That's perfect. Uh, going back to reparations. So given all the discussion around reparations and we're going to open up the floor to the audience very soon so who has questions all right perfect man because yeah i want you guys to gear up to really you know um give our guests here some good questions so what are black people to do i'm going to keep it all the way 100 with you right now i'm not a democrat nor i'm a republican you know i am a non-party voter you know as far as voting in this election, 2020, I'm not even sure, you know. Now, last time I wrote in um, Monica Moorhead, you know, and I put that on Facebook. Uh, she's a uh, part of the Workers World Party or World Workers Workers World. Yeah. Workers World Party. Thank you. Yeah. So I so so like I wrote her in last time. This time around, just given the fact that. Every other week, this new candidate, I heard, what's his face came in? Bill de Blasio came yeah. the other day, like, come on now, like, you know, I'm not even sure who I'm going to, you know, give my vote to, you know, at this point. But, you know, what should black people do? You know, what should black people do, given now that reparations is on the table? You know, um, some very powerful sisters in D.C., they actually approached Bernie Sanders about that on CNN. And that was powerful because they had my, they had, he's <laughs> Now, Bernie's not my man at all, but they had your man stuttering and everything, like, quiet. Like, I like, like I thoroughly enjoyed that. But in terms of just organizing around the issue, right, given the fact that, you know, our generation relative to previous generations aren't reading as much or as often, right, how do we organize around that, you know, within this time frame? You know, how do we, you know, educate people with those issues or, like, how do we, you know, really gear people up, right, to, you know, to think about 2020, you know, um, what, what's the strategy at this point? Well, you know, we always talk, Sam, about voter registration, and that's important. But we also, we used to talk more about voter education. Gotcha. And a lot of us feel that when we vote, that that's the end of the political process. No. That that should be the beginning of the political process. You read about these white supremacists right after Obama, was elected, they formed the Tea Party. You know, and I mean, they said we're gonna organize against Obama. You know, regardless of what you thought about Obama, they organized. We have to do the same thing. I'm hoping Stacey Abrams jump in, but that's, you know, she keeps saying that she might, she might, she might. But I think that black folk have to have litmus tests. Like, white folks have litmus tests. Like, you saw this week what they did about abortion. I mean, they did that, I mean, that's the most, even this white supremacist, Pat Robertson, said, 
it's too gone too far. Mm -hmm. They have litmus right. tests about the Second Amendment, carrying guns. Black folks should have litmus tests too. Mine, of course, is reparation. And you better come correct. I didn't like when Bernie was saying, well, I don't know what reparations are. Yeah. You know, read a book. What does it look like? Yeah, what does it look like? He know what uh, universal health care looks like. Mm -hmm. Read a book. You know, and I, I believe that when people give answers like that, I, I ask them all. Whether or not we should vote next year is going to be, as far as I'm concerned, and I'm with you, I'm going to vote depending on what I see is the Don't. candidate that is the most closest to what I feel about the issue of reparation. And I ain't talking about no commission. I'm talking about, and if there's none, I'm going to write in. I mean, I'm being straight up with you. So with that being said, right, what do you say about, you know, um, the contention of our folks who don't vote, you know, who who pretty much sit out, you know, they, you know, they're on the front lines, of course, you know, they're taking care of their families, they're in the community, but they've pretty much absolved from voting out of this belief and this frustration that their vote wouldn't count anyway, and that, you know, even if they voted for this person, once they get in the office, they're beholden to other people anyway. You're like, what's your, you know, what, what's your take on that situation? Because I often come across folks like that, you know, I'm just well, I mean, you don't have to vote. I mean, you can vote the down tickets. They say all politics, what's that white boy Simple O'Neill said years ago? All politics is local. The most important politics is what's happening here in D.C. In these uh, eight, eight, right? Yeah. These eight, what do you call wars? wars. You got to vote. Eight. This is what is important right here. And I think PG County is, is it says, nah, becoming the ninth nah, ward. You know, that's what they're moving on. I mean, the whole issue of gentrification in D.C., they moving y'all out. You, you know that white boy, I read it on the internet about he didn't like the noise was too loud. Turn it down. You got to vote for issues that are local. If you don't like who's running for president, that's fine. Get involved with local politics. But don't say, I ain't going to vote at all. You, I mean, you got to do some Voting is the least political thing you can do. And, and you realize, I mean, and I do it because I know my ancestors died for this stuff. And I mean, Fannie Lou Hamer, you should read how she was beaten on her feet, you know, to a pulp that she limped for all of her life practically because of that. Man, I gotta vote. I don't have to vote with everybody, but I gotta vote locally, do something about that, be involved politically. What are some local issues in Baltimore? You know, um, well, first we gotta get a, we gotta get a good mayor. Yeah, okay. yeah, definitely. Oh, yeah. That's you know, our last two mayors, as you know, have left <laughs> office because of corruption. Um, also, right now in Baltimore, you probably heard we, we've experienced a cyber attack. What? You can't pay your water bill. You can't close the deal on a house because they want a hunt. They've been upping it up. You know, ten thousand dollars a day is up to a hundred and ten thousand dollars. So the government of Baltimore right now ain't working. Um, mm -hmm. What are the issues in Baltimore? Similar issues to D.C. gentrification. I was listening to a the former mayor two mayors ago. This sister got up there and said that her goal. This is a black mayor. She said her goal was that you know you should. Uh, we're going to have Baltimore to Ed's and Med's. And I didn't know what she meant, Ed's yeah. and Med's. I wrote it down. My mother always told me to write down stuff you don't understand and look it up. Yeah. You know, I still, Ed's and Med's. But by the end of the meeting, I figured out, she said that her goal for Baltimore was to have educational institutions and medical institutions. Yeah. So you got Morgan, University of Maryland, Johns Hopkins, and, and the black folk just move someplace. They Ed's and Med's. So you gotta be, you know, pay attention to school board. Look, if y'all don't do something in DC, y'all gonna have a white mayor pretty soon. Oh, that's the prediction. I heard somebody tell me that that Muriel Bowser's the last black mayor.
see, I mean, white people are moving back to these cities. See, gentrification is occurring every place. And you ever notice when white folks gentrify, they always rename the area. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so like, no Yeah, like in, like in Harlem, they call it So Hot. So Hot. That was Southern Harlem. Oh, God. There's an area of Baltimore, that, you know, the east side, we call it the Middle East. Mm -hmm. People go bang, bang, pow, yeah. pow, like, but we call it the Middle East. I went to a movie down there and this, all of a sudden I started hearing this thing called The Core. Mm -hmm. like the you know, and they would rename the Middle East. White people always rename, and I'll tell you another thing, I'm telling you this as an urban researcher. Another exa example of when they're going to gentrify, gentrify and where they're going to gentrify is when you start seeing them building up infrastructure. Yep. Mm -hmm. When you start Balance. seeing them with those backhoes and laying down fiber optic network and you see water pipes being replaced, yep. that's a sign of gentrification. Yeah. Uh, there's a book by one of my colleagues, Mindy Fully Love. She's a psychiatrist at Columbia. She's written this book called Root Shock yeah. and how when you displace people, particularly black folk, psychological problems occur. Like we know after Katrina that there was a huge spike in suicide among black folk who were relocated outside of New Orleans. And so root shock is something that is going to be experienced in D.C. and so forth. And then I was thinking, white folk, you don't even know they also, I don't know if they're doing that in D.C., but they put these bike lanes, mm -hmm. yeah. and these little poles sticking out the ground. Mm -hmm. I said, yeah. they're getting ready to gentrify yeah. that. Yeah. And these are, we've done research, in, you know, at the Institute, so this, this is what actually occurs when stuff like that happens. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so I guess to circle back to reparations, because you bring up a whole lot of great points, and after this question, I'm, I'm about to open the floor to the audience. Um, <laughs> You know what? What's your take then on on just the distribution of land? You know, so you know um, the Nation of Islam. They often say, "All right, give me five states." Uh, you had um, another movement. Uh, uh, um, Republic of New Africa. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Republic of New Africa. You know, they had the whole southeastern United States or so, right? That they wanted. Um, I'm of the personal belief that like that like that's the very least that they can do, you know, just because land, you know, owning land, being able to build on it, grow food on it, um, you know, have infrastructure, have, you know, the ports or whatever else, you know, to bring stuff back. Like that's the very least that they could do for our people. You know, um, what does that look like, you know, if it is to come to fruition, just given the way that gentrification is. I don't see them doing that, you know, just based off just based off of what I see with gerrymandering, the way that they divide districts to really, you know, dilute our votes anyway. So I'm just curious to see your whole take on that. Um, you know, just, you know, what's the possibility of that? You know, what does that look like? And, you know, in your research specifically, what have you come across concerning that? Well, you know, land ownership, I just did an interview for New, York, New Yorker about confiscation of black land. That's said earlier. And the reporter asked me, she said, well, almost identical question. I think black folk feel that when we own a house, we own land. Mm -hmm. And you don't. That's not land. <coughs> land is when it may not even be anything on it, you know, but that's what you own. And I'm pessimistic. I'm being very straight with you, Sam. I'm pessimistic in us really owning land the way we did a hundred years ago. Um, I don't know if you know about this air property stuff and how property is all chopped up now. White folks did that stuff deliberately. I think again we've got to turn our eyes eastward to Africa. Um, I've got students right now, one of my students, Sarah Davis, she's in Namibia right now. She's been there for four years and she <laughs> bought her three acres of land and she has, what is it when you have uh, growing fish, aqua, Hydroponic. aqua. Hydroponic. No, that's the plant. She, she's growing Aquifer. fish. Aquifer? I think that's what it is, aqua something. Lake. But anyway, she's growing fish. And she said, forget America. You know, I'm going. I'm going with it. And I think if you don't want to go to Africa, go to the <laughs> Caribbean, you know. And I, I think in this country, white people are going to continue to encroach on inner city properties, all the research that we're doing, 
you know, I, I talk to other people who are, have this whole idea about black folk buying up land collectively in cities. Baltimore, we've got 13,000 abandoned homes. And maybe there is a program to say, let's rehabilitate these homes and these whole blocks should be ours. But I'm, pre I'm kind of pessimistic about it, brother, to be honest with you. Definitely understood. Uh, the floor's not open for questions if anybody has any, you know. All right, perfect. I'm going to give you the mic real quick. Oh, I could just yell. <laughs> All right, cool, cool. Okay. Um, so when you, I'm sure white people have approached you and said, well, I had nothing to do with slavery. I don't own any slaves. I'm, my immediate family going back, you know, grandparents and all that, they didn't own any slaves either. So why do we have to pay reparations? Well, you know, it's interesting you said that because a white boy called me up today on the, not today, this week on the phone, he said the exact same thing. He said he's supporting Kamala Harris. And you probably have heard Kamala's going to set up her campaign headquarters in Baltimore. Because I guess she's trying to get some more blacks or something. You know, I ain't going to get into that. Uh, and so he's supporting her. But he don't support reparation because he said his father didn't own slaves, as he put it, and came over here on Ellis Island. Well, look, I didn't have anything to do with the incarceration of Japanese Americans in 1941 and 42. Um, I wasn't even alive then, believe it or not, you know. But I paid taxes in 1988 under that real radical president named Ronald Reagan, of all people, for reparations for the Japanese. All of us have paid reparations for the Lakota, the people you may call Sioux, uh, the Klamath Indians of um, Oregon. And so it's, a, it's funny how America, when it, and white people particularly, when they want you know, like some, what they consider good occurs. You know, well, we gotta stand behind our country, you know, and attack Iran. That's the latest saber rattle, you know. We gotta stand behind, get rid of these immigrants that have taken our jobs, which they ain't, but that's another discussion. I had a black person say that to me, that's, that's another discussion too. But when it comes to doing, dealing with America's crimes, White people don't want to have anything to do with them. Nope. They'll tell me to remember the Alamo <laughs> and remember the Maine. <laughs> we, have, we even have Memorial Day. But when we say, well, let's talk about enslavement. No, we don't want to talk. That happened a long time ago. So did the 4th of July. We do celebrate that every day. I mean, every four, so, you know, white people are very hypocritical. If you read uh, Ta-Nehisi Coates' book, I saw it up there called Between the World and Me. Coates says something is brilliant. He said, America will never be America unless they pay reparations to black people. And so he talks about white people. He doesn't call them white people. He says people trying to be white. Mm -hmm. Cause they associate being white. Right, and then white people just lie. I mean, I mean, I wish I could say it more sophisticated. They just lie. So like Colin Kaepernick been kneeling for a couple years now. Well, he disrespecting the flag and the Star Spangled Banner and our truth. Colin Powell, Colin, Colin, Powell, Colin pa Kaepernick is kneeling simply because he's drawing attention to what happened to Sandra Bland. What happened to Michael Brown, Trayvon Martin. All of these people, it's about police brutality. But they lie about it. They lie. And I never let white people lie to me. Don't just because somebody, when a white person asks me, I try to, I don't know if y'all you know, are Neely Fuller, but you gotta, when white people say to me, well, you guys believe in uh, reverse discrimination, I don't start answering the question. I said, well, what do you mean by reverse discrimination? And they don't even know what they mean by it. Right. What do you mean by patriotism? I've had white people say to me, well, you know, you sound like a racist. What do you mean by being a racist? They don't even know. So, you know, 
So I kind of work it like that. When white people start, and then here's another white folks. Are, but did y'all enslave each other? I said, well, Jews, you know, had Juden rots. I don't know if you ever heard of that in Poland. They sent Jews, these were Jews who sent Jews to the gas chamber. And they had these groups called Juden rots. There were, you know, Native Americans who scouted for Custer at Little Bighorn. There were uh, Japanese who in turn helped in turn all people participate in their oppression, but we don't blame those people on the oppression. You, you see what I'm saying? So we, we're confused about a lot of things. I've heard black folks say, well, didn't we enslave each other? Yeah, we did. Some of us did, one-tenth of one percent. And we still participate in our slavery. I mean, enslavement. You know, Clarence Thomas is a super slave. Oh, yeah. He's on the Supreme Court, but he's still oppressing our people. So all you know, white those white women that voted down there and for that abortion, white women will oppress each other. Mm -hmm. But don't let me get. I want to start okay. preaching. Gotcha. Okay. I was just wondering, is there an entity that um, focuses on perhaps um, unifying your glass concept of the grassroots? the legislation, the attorneys, the scholars, the students, and could that be something that actually shores them up or gives them strength to you know, unify and collectively um, address the needs? The answer is sort of kind. Um, you know, I'm a scholar, so I write. And we put, I put this model up and we're gonna be talking about it and trying to organize and co over along those lines. Uh, the meeting in in Detroit, I keep mentioning it, and next month is going to be a come to Jesus moment, if you understand what I'm saying. I mean, we're going to talk shop, and we're going to talk, frankly, about <coughs> stuff. Some of the presidential candidates are supposed to be coming to the same. We'll see how many come. But um, I think the, the model works, and I based it on the research I did on how all black movements work. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for your work, too. Uh, in my mind, there are two very strong distinctions that is owed to the African people. One is reparations, and one is compensation. Those two things have to be distinguished because they're not the same thing. Compensation is financial of some sort. Reparations means repairing what the damage that has been done. Those two things need to be made very clear and very distinct and stop being confused because whether money is paid or not, reparations has to take place. Whether reparations happen or not, compensation is owed. And I think we need to be very clear that we need both. It's a good point, and uh, that's why a lot of us that are really into reparation use the term compensatory justice, because justice can come in the form as you just outlined, uh, compensation and reparations. So, yeah, it, I mean, I appreciate that, and it, it, it is it is true. Uh, some people are only going to get compensated. Reparations are going to happen. I mean, I'm I know they're going to happen, and I believe they're going to happen. When I wrote Should America Pay, I thought they were going to happen within 10 years and they happened in five, these so-called down payments, as I call them. I think that we're going to see reparations in the next five years and so forth. Great, dude. I don't need a mic. Okay. So I always got a question. Like, um, if I'm with you. I believe reparations will occur. But I always wonder, my, my question is when it does occur, is what's next? So I've always wondered, is this something that we get? that we just keep flowing into the, like, the white economic structure? Or is this something, money, that we take and we build a whole new economic system? And how can we put a plan in place to keep it from when we do get this money just to keep making more white people rich? Well, that's a good question. You know, it's like I always ask, like, what do we got about maybe 15 people in this audience? You know? If all of us, just make it up, we had a check for $400,000. I'm gonna just get real 
I'm going to talk about, you know, compensation now. $400,000. So we would have 400000 times 15. What is that? I'm that bad enough. $6 million? Something like $6 million. You know, I always ask audiences like that, well, would you go out and buy a Cadillac? The answer is no. You can pool money together, you know, in a variety. This guy, this Asian brother running for president, uh, Yang, did you hear what he said? His argument is he wants to give every American $1,000 at the beginning of every month. Just give it to them. Do whatever they want to with. So that's $12,000 a year, roughly. Now, is that a form of reparation? You know, kind of, sort of, because he wants to give it to everybody. I think that with people, and people are thinking this stuff through. I've got, you know, some stuff at the end of one of my books about what you, we ought to be doing now. I think that we've got to start talking about, do we build our own businesses? I'm not talking about getting a franchise from McDonald's, but I'm saying start something brand new. Uh, one thing I've always dreamt, and maybe because I'm a second, I wish there was a nationwide chain of black daycare centers that was affordable for black, because I talked to so many black mothers who can't afford daycare, and wouldn't it be good if we had a chain of those? We've got to think outside of the box about stuff. There are going to be people that will say, I'm going to go overseas. Forget this country. I'm going to Ghana. I'm buying me five acres of land, and I'm doing this. I'm out of here. I'm out of here. You know, my friend Randall Robinson, he don't live in America anymore. He lives with his wife and same kids. And when he told, he wrote a book called Leaving America. And he just said, I'm through with this race. I said, man, you ain't leaving this country. Randall been living over there, I think, about 13 years. He said he, he'll never come back to this country. The only time he comes back is to give a lecture. And so I think that there's, what we've got to do, and this is why I say, I, as a psychologist, I include this whole idea of mental reparations. You know, see, what's her name? Cardi. Well, she ain't, that's not a good example. <laughs> Little Wayne needs reparations. Little Wayne, that's just not. Mm -hmm. Little Wayne needs reparations, but it's, he don't need the compensation, but he needs psychological reparations. Yes, yes, yes. You understand what I'm saying? Yes. And so I devote a, Wade Nobles, in yes, fact, wrote yes. the chapter, The Black Psychologist, how we are messed up in our head. Ben Carson needs reparations. Yes. But it's different from other people. We have to psychologically think differently about, you know, ourselves. We do. You know, two, two days, uh, yeah, Sunday is the birthday of uh, Sam Greenlee. I don't know if you ever, he wrote this book called The Spook That Steps Out of the Door. And you ought to read that book because it talks about mental liberation. And we have to mentally liberate ourselves from stuff. And, 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 Say we ain't gonna do certain things again. Addicted to so that's a brief follow-up question. <laughs> sure. Like, so my, my only question is, I I I, I agree with Arnold what she's saying, but I was having this conversation with somebody the other day. Like nowadays, he was it was an older guy, and he was saying like back in the '60s, he used to tell everybody everybody knew they were in the same boat. He said now nah, you got people these integrationists who I can't stand, um, these people that like this is better. How do you convince? My question is, three people that think they really got all these other options that you mentally deranged when they got money, they got cars. How do you convince somebody like, okay, I got a nice job, I got a nice car, this is it. How do you convince somebody that's like mentally messed up like that? I mean, it's a good question. I went to school, I don't know if you ever heard of Bobby Ray. I know, yes. Dr. Bobby Psychopathic Ray. racial person. Right, yeah. we were in the same class together at the University of Chicago back in the day. And Bobby used to say something, and it's true. I used to say, come on, Bobby. He said there's only two types of groups in the black community. And he talked about globally. He says the integrationists and there's the black nationalists. Yeah. That's, and he said, well, what, you know, what about black Marxists? Integrationists. Mm -hmm. You see, what about Nation of Islam? Black nationalists. He said all black folk are in one of those two groups. And he says, 
he wanted to move, and that's why he wrote Psychopathic Racist Bird. You probably know his metaphor about the bullfight. And he wanted for us to push people towards black nationalism. And, and, and it's interesting now, you don't see as many young black nationalists now. I talk to a lot of young people say, well, you know, Dr. Wimbush, I'm going to marry a white woman. I mean, they don't say it like that, but, you know, I'm going to marry a white man, whatever. <laughs> Integration. So, black nationalism is Garvey, is Malcolm. You know, it's, you know, if you read Nkrumah closely, he was a Marxist to be sure, but he was a nationalist because he wanted a united Africa. You know, but we don't have that many young black nationalists anymore. Yeah. You know, and it's something that I try to recruit in my classes. I teach that stuff. Yeah, right. I'm finishing up. I hope some of you have passed these out. Uh, we're doing a book on um, our next, my next book is on Frances Gress Wells, and some of you know her, and she was a black nationalist psychiatrist. Yeah. And I think that how you get people to that, like Malcolm said, you know, the problem with us is that we made the mistake of trying to organize, you know, organize people. But he said we try to organize a sleeping people. Yeah. And I think you got to wake people up about nationalism. And the way I do it is cite our history and what they're doing to us on a global level. It. It's, it ain't easy. Yeah. It ain't easy. Yeah, yeah bro. And then the sister up here, yeah. To, the, to that point, um, a former pastor once, you know, at one of these things, said that one of the biggest mistakes that he said the pastors did was try to convince all black people they were right. Okay, and, and, and because they were young and they were full of their philosophical energy and da 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 da, and they spent, he said, they spent all this time trying to convince people to do something they had no intention of doing. And he said they wasted a lot of time instead of just organizing people who were predisposed to do what they want. Or, or follow their 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 ideological and political goals, and not worry about people who didn't want to do. It. And I use the analogy: if you want to play, if you want to create a basketball team, you don't go to the tennis court and, and, and rail against people because they don't want to play basketball. Right. You go to the basketball court to find people who already want to play basketball. Yeah. And I think a great, I think a major problem with black people, and you say the integrationists and the and the nationalists. Um, Bottom line is most people who can produce stuff that makes my life better. And the black nationalists have failed greatly in having a model, a real model of, of, of production that can actually benefit black people. And that's why many people go into the integrationist camp because they see that that model can give them a house, a job, uh, you know, whatever, whatever. And, but and, see and, that's oh, well, well, let me finish. Let me finish. Okay. I'm I, I'm making an observation. I got you. Okay, I'm making an observation, and it's a real observation because in D.C. in D.C. Um, there's no there's no tangible expression of black nationalism. It's you have a lot of rhetoric, you have a lot of aspirational talk, but black nationalists don't control the D.C. Council like. Chuck Wade and the Mumba put together a, a group of black people in, in, in Jackson, Mississippi, and took over Jackson, Mississippi political council. So, so here you got all these these thinkers, but they don't do, they can't do in D.C. what they what, what a few black people with a plan did in Jackson, Mississippi. And even when Chuck Wade and Mumba died, his 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 son and the people carried on the plan. So, so I'm waiting because because I tell people revolutions are not. Rhetorical, historical, you know, exercises. They're engineering projects. If you can't create on the ground real stuff, if you can't engineer your revolution, you're going to die. 
you can you can talk all you want, you can write all the books you want, but if you can't provide food, clothing, and shelter, if you can't kill your enemy and protect your own people, then you you don't you don't die. that's what's happening in South Africa. South Africa has a failed revolution because because I don't even call it a revolution. It's, it was it was a forced integrationism. That was their goal to force integration. So they had these 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 hearings, these these uh, reconciliation hearings, all that stuff. Said so, no, revolution is about somebody's in power. Whoever was in power has to be taken out of power. The people coming into power has to make sure they never stay in power. So they the, if if there was a re and this is going to have to take place in South Africa because because. If you let the De Beers keep the diamonds, and you let all the other people keep the oil and be in control of the banks, you don't have a revolution. All you have is black people overseeing your degradations, which is why the black ANC shot up the miners who went on strike a few years ago because it was all about the money. And I'm just saying that's where we are, where we are at. We don't have any tangible models of productivity that can actually create a social structure that we can afford and that we can produce and that we can control. And, and until we get to that point where, whether it be international or other countries, whether it be here, whether it be state, whether it be at local, we have to start actually creating a real model that can produce at, a, at, at the local level that's, that can show people they know what they want, they can demonstrate that they can do it, I agree that it's better than the status quo, and then I will choose to be a part of it. Until you get those steps, if it's all just the rhetoric, people are going to go integrationist because that's the only model in the United States that produces stuff for people. Okay, I, I, I want to answer, but does anyone want to respond to that? You, I know you do. I ain't gonna say nothing. So let's go you and then up here. I, I, I'll be up here all night, so I don't want I mean, so, yes. We got 25 minutes. So. Alright, so the only thing, I, I do feel like there is a model that's been used before. That well, I think we, there is a model. Yeah, I action, think. But I, I'll see it. I think that we got a pan African model that's been used in the past. So that's clearly been labeled out to like connect with black people globally, economically. We got pan African political agendas that I think the only reason that is we haven't succeeded is because we've had a boot on our neck. You know, because every time we attempt to like try to get our agenda on a local, national, or international scale, somebody does that. The other thing you, you say the integration works. Well, we've been integrated for like now 50, 60 years. I didn't say integration works. I said people gravitated. I said people gravitate toward integrationism because it's the only model that produces for them tangible benefits. I'm not saying it works for them. I'm saying that there's no competing model that says, hey, look, we can give you food, clothing, and shelter, too. That's what I'm saying. I'm not saying it works. I'm not making a, mor I'm not making a moral judgment. I'm making an observation of why it doesn't work. I'm, I'm doing an analysis. Do you think we have any models of black nationalism right now that are working? What do you define as work? Work. The, what do you define? It's, it's no, no, the answer is no. There's, the, I, I what, know what no about, model, what about, I have no... Can I, I, I finish, I, can I finish yeah. now? What about the Nation of Islam? No. Why, why not? Because it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a small...